chapter 6 is what happens when you don't do what you're supposed to do. It's going to be about fact-finding missions. It's going to be about what the frack will do as far as administrative fines. It's going to be talking about stipulations and about notices of non-compliance. We're going to be talking about violations of law, criminal, and civil, and what we're going to do to resolve any of these situations. That's basically what Chapter 6 is, titled as Violations of License Law Penalties and Procedures. So this is all the boring administrative legal stuff that we have to do. Nine times out of ten, you're never going to deal with this. But the questions are going to say things like blind advertisements, right? We talked about that mm -hmm. yesterday. They're going to talk about rental lists. You need to know what those fines are, right? So rental list is a first degree misdemeanor, right? If you don't give a current rental list, $1,000 fine. 60 something dollars, right? $1,000 fine. One year in prison, right? If so it's a second degree misdemeanor, it's six. It's sixty day, or it's it's two months, right. five hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. You're never going to see that one. The other one you're going to see is felony. Third degree felony is going to be five years, five thousand dollars. So we're going to go over that. We're going to go over how to remember that stuff so that you can move forward. Now, the third degree mis uh, third degree felony would be practicing without a real estate license, paying a commission to a salary unlicensed assistant, for example, right? That's gonna be one of those things. So let's go forward and it's not moving. So give me just one second. We're gonna start the slideshow. Here. Beginning. So we're having a little bit of technical difficulties as usual. Let's see if this works. We're working now. So here's your legal terms to know. We'll just go through the legal terms. Same thing, we're gonna read through the slides. I'm gonna explain each line, all right? Mm -hmm. So legal terms to know, breach of trust. What is a breach of trust? You're breaking somebody's trust, right? Mm -hmm. Breach is breaking, right? Breaking somebody's promise or obligation. Remember we put that earnest money into an account, into a account, put an escrow, there's gonna be a dispute. We talked about mediation, arbitration, litigation, right? Escrow is first in order. Talked about that. Well, breaking that promise is what's going to cause you to have a buyer dispute, right? Just some type of obligation. You didn't close on your property when you're supposed to, for example. The term commingle is to take my money and mix it with your money, right? So if I'm taking my personal money and putting it in my escrow account, more than the allowed amount, more than the thousand dollars for the operations account, more than the five thousand dollars. For the property management escrow account, that's the problem, right? I can't mix my money with my customer's money over the maximum allowed. Right? So commingling is that term. Concealment means what? I'm hiding to hide. So a seller just got their roof le leak fixed, painted it with kills, to hide. and then tells you, don't tell anybody about it. That's concealment. We have to disclose all material facts, whether we have a brokerage relationship or not. We talked about brokerage relationships, right? Three different ones, single agency, transaction broker, and no brokerage relationship, can't conceal material facts, right? That's not withholding information on an offer or a counter offer whenever they tell you, I don't wanna, I wanna sell it for 500,000, but I can't tell the buyer that. So that's not concealment. Concealment is when it's something that's gonna affect the other person, right? Conversion, taking some funds and converting them to something else, right? Mm -hmm. Using, the, using the, the escrow funds 
to pay your electric bill would be an example of conversion, right? And then we have this real estate pretty term called culpable negligence. Basically, it just says you can't act like you don't know what you're doing because you have a license, right? You can't just plead negligence. If you have a license, you're expected to understand and know things, right? We call it culpable negligence, but honestly, it's just negligence. So far, we're good, right? Okay. It is not moving again. Conversion and license misuse. So more legal terms. I love these these. I love these things. They just don't ever work like they're supposed to. I bet it will now. There we go. So more legal terms. Failure to account or deliver. Right. Failing to deliver personally property to the person entitled to it. So in this sense, if if I sell my house. Everything that's listed while it's in the MLS is what they get. If they take that Tiffany chandelier out of their house and it was there when they showed the house, that's failing to account and deliver. You're not delivering it right. It could be money too, right? It could be anything of material value. So it doesn't necessarily have to be a physical piece of property. Most of the time it's appliances, mm -hmm. right? I've had people load up their washer and dryer when it was in the contract. Mm -hmm. Those kind of things will cause a problem. That'd be fine. Right. Um, fraud. So what is fraud? Fraud's intentionally deceiving somebody, right? To get somebody to part value, right? Mm -hmm. So we can defraud you out of your car, your house, any of these things. I mean, the definition of fraud is pretty easy. You're, you're physically trying to deceive somebody. We already know what a material fact is, right? It's relevant, right? Relevant information. Remember what's not relevant? AIDS, somebody dying in a house, haunted houses. We don't have to say that. Are they state of Florida? Um, and then this term moral turpitude basically just can, it's conduct that isn't isn't honest, right? So if they if you see this, just know that somebody's being dishonest, right? Moral turpitude is dishonesty. You know, they like to give you double negatives in the real estate world. On the state exam, they'll say, we're not going to do this, and then it'll say, "Well, we can do this, but we're not this," or something. It'll be like a double negative, so you're going to get confused, right? Which is false? Then they'll give you something that's false, and then say, "Well, we can't do the false thing," <laughs> so then it's true. So, so they twist it. So on they you. twist it on you. So you have to be careful. Right. For me, that's dishonesty, <laughs> but they're doing it so that you learn the material. Make you stronger. So what happens if somebody complains on you? Well, what happens is the FRAC will investigate you. Um, so the complaints filed, we go right on the web and do it. We can write a letter. There's all you know. There's a couple different ways we can do it. Once a complaint is filed, there's an investigation period. Nothing goes up on your license. Nothing goes up on there until we actually find you guilty, right? So all this stuff is really not a problem up to here, right? We're actually up to here. Complaints filed, investigation of the complaint. So they have this fact finding committee that will investigate the claim. I'm just going to go through the list. Probable cause determination was there probable cause, right? Formal complaints issued if there is probable cause, there's either an informal or formal hearing. Then we have a final order and judicial review. So judicial, judicial review will be your appeal, right? That's when you get your attorney and you say, well, I don't really agree with this. Here's my story. So here's step one. Step one is somebody files a complaint, right? They have to match it up with some type of rule. You can't just say this guy was terrible. That's not a complaint. The state doesn't doesn't recognize that. According to rule 47525, the accused did X Y Z, right? Put a lien against my house for his commission. We're going to see if that's really a rule. Uniform complaint files formed with the, or the form is filed with the Department of Business and Professional Regulation. If there is something found legally sufficient, if it was truly under some type of Florida statute, do you for a rule or FREC rule, then they'll move to the next step. If not, they'll throw it out. Because sometimes people complain because they're mad. Well, I sold my house at cheap, cheap. It's not a 
law violation. You signed that saying it was okay to buy, sell it for that, right? <laughs> That's not a law violation. That was somebody that agreed to something and they weren't happy with it. Well, they shouldn't agree to it, right? So complaints can be anonymous. DPR may investigate anonymous complaints, ones made by a confidential informant, provided that the complaints in writing are legally sufficient. You can't just call in a verbal complaint and have them take you seriously. You need to take the time to actually file a written complaint, right? The alleged violation is substantial. Again, you can't say, well, they sold my house for $20,000 under market. Okay, so what? You agreed to that $20,000 under market. The DVPR has be reason to believe the alleged violations are true. So is there established patterns? Did something happen? Has this person had prior complaints before? Stuff like that. Because what you'll see is people that have license violations have multiple license violations. They don't just have one. Everybody starts with one. So you normally there's a pattern. Have I don't have any. Nobody. So you're people. saying it's hard to get violations. I only know two people that have one. And I know a lot of real estate agents. Um, and one of those has a revoked license. Um, consumer complaint is, it's always driven, right? So remember I said it's a self-policing business? Well, it's driven by consumers. It's also driven by agents. The difference is, is the agents that are that are driving these complaints are not usually driving legal complaints, they're driving ethics complaints. So it's going to the board of real estate, not to the state, not to frack. It's gonna to go to your local board. All right, so then you have this, so then everybody, okay, now that we found out this is a legitimate complaint, we have an investigation, right? This investigation, we're going to label the parties, right? The complainant is who? It's the person that filed the complaint, right? If you make the complaint, you're the complainant. You're going to find a lot of this in this business. Who's the guarantor? Who's the grantor? Who's, you know, who's the leasee? Who's the lessor? Those things are going to, it's going to start getting confusing, right? So a complainant files a complaint. Copy is sent to the subject of the investigation. So if I file a complaint on you, you, you get, get a letter. letter. You get a letter. Hey, somebody has filed a complaint on you. This is what they're accusing you of. You can respond with a written response. I didn't do this, this is the real story. Let me respond to you. Department of Business then does their investigation, issues an investigation report, right? And then we submit this report to the probable cause panel. We're gonna talk about the composition of the probable cause panel in a second. Um, the complaint, the complaint information obtained during this investigation is confidential until 10 days after the probable cause is found. It's always confidential. Because what if they find out that nothing was wrong? Then you have a tainted record, right? Mm -hmm. We don't want to put you out of business because somebody was mad and made, made a false complaint on you. Right? Once it's found true or true to their best belief, it's that innocence until proven guilty, right? If it's bad enough, they're going to they're going to do this thing called a uh, summary suspension. Basically, if it's something that is financially hurting the public, it's something that's endangering the public, they're going to do an emergency stop, right? They're going to say, I'm not going to allow the, the licensee to work any longer while the investigation is being completed. If the investigation comes out favorable, you're going to be in you're going to go right back to work. If it comes out negative, they're probably going to look into something else like a suspension or a revocation, right? Secretary of State can issue a summary suspension. It's also called an emergency suspension. So if you see it on a test, in what case would an agent have a summary suspension? Well, if they found probable cause and it's something that would endanger the public, then that's when we would issue the suspension, right? So it might be listed that way unless they examine the suspension, right? And there's going to be four other answers, three other answers, so that's an emergency suspension because it's an emergency suspension public. or a summary suspension. You're going to see it as summary suspension on the exam. Summary suspension. Yeah. So they're going to be like, well, what is that? Mm -hmm. Well, it's making a summary. No, it's <laughs> it's stopping you if you're endangering the public. All right, so then we have step three. Step three is probable cause, right? This is we now have these reasonable cause, these reasonable grounds for your prosecution, right? Probable cause panel is two individuals. One member must be currently serving on the commission, on the real estate commission, on FRAC. Right, so one of the, remember the seven people? 
five brokers, four four which are active, right? One consumer. One consumer. Or two consumers. One has to be over sixty. Yeah. Well, yeah. Two consumers are over. Of the five brokers or five licensees, professionals, one can be sales licensee or broker associate. The other four have to be brokers. Right. So at least one member must be a former current professional member of the commission, right? One must currently serve on the commission. This one person could be both, and you could have another person. Does that make sense? Must currently serve or want, must be a former or current professional. So if they're a current professional, they could satisfy both of those, and you could have a consumer. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. The current or former. So they could have been an agent. Now they're inactive, but they still would qualify because they're former. Right, correct, correct. So a grand jury arrangement, so what that means is we have to have some type of, we have some, some type of agreement. So for probable cause panel, if there's two people, you have to have a majority, right? Well, unfortunately, you don't have a majority if there's two people. So you have to have a unanimous consent, right? Because if one person chooses, then it's 50-50, it's a split vote, right? If it was three people, then you would be able to have two votes over one for a majority. But in this case, because it says majority vote, it's really a unanimous vote because there's only two people. Does that make sense? Okay. Complainant and subject and subject of the complainant are so subject of the complaint are you, right? Subject to the complaint is a defendant, right? You got the complainant and then you got the defendant or respondent, they call them respondents. In the criminal or civil thing, it's it's plaintiff, defendant, complainant, respondent, right? They're sent the written notice of the outcome of the probable cause. At this point, we can dismiss the case or dismiss with a letter of guidance, right? So dismiss with a letter of guidance means here's what we need to do to rectify the situation. We don't think it's that much, we don't think it's that much of a problem. We just want to educate you. Because remember, Freck's choices are, the reasons for Freck is to protect the community, right? and to educate the agents on how to do that. So they can dismiss it with just some type of letter saying, listen, in the future you need to be like this way, right? And we're gonna, we're gonna evaluate that. We're gonna watch you, we're gonna audit you. We're gonna do things to make sure that you're, you are doing this in compliance. Or they can just say, look, it wasn't a problem at all. We're just gonna let it go, right? Thanks for your time, appreciate your cooperation. You're no longer in trouble. So if they find probable cause, they go ahead and submit this quote, formal complaint. And the administrative complaint sent by email, US mail, certified mail to whatever address you have a record. Remember, you have to change that address within 10 days. Why? Because they need to contact you. Mm -hmm. And that starts the timeline for you to respond to things. So you have to, you always have to have a current address on file. Probable cause exists. DBPR files this formal complaint, an allegation of facts and charges against the licensee. So you're going to get a formal letter saying this is what you've been accused of. Copy set to me or any broker, right? You have 21 days to respond. So licensee is also sent election of rights. Now it's total 31 days in this case, but 21 days to respond, they're going to send you something within 10 days, right? Typically. Well, maybe not, but typically. You have 21 days to respond. You're gonna get it real quick. Trust me, they're not gonna drag you out. It doesn't say 10 days on here, you don't need to know that, but most of the time it's gonna be done that period. So here's your rights, right? You can dispute it. You can dispute the allegations. You cannot dispute the allegations, right? You can request a formal hearing or an informal hearing. You can waive your hearing. So these are the things. You're not gonna have a formal hearing unless you're disputing it, right? Because mm -hmm. that's like going to court. It's like going to trial. You're gonna get in front of the board, the real estate commissioner, whoever you need to sit in front of. The other two things, if you're not disputing it, there's no reason to show up because you're not disputing it. So you can do it and waive the right or you can do it and request the informal hearing. Either one. If you don't respond, then you give up the right to dispute, right? You have three weeks to respond. That makes sense, right? If you don't, if you don't respond, you're assuming that they're 
allegations are true, right? Mm-hmm. I don't know anybody that wouldn't respond. Everybody three, three weeks respond. to respond. Three weeks, but remember 21 days. 21, because that's what they're going to throw at you. So then we have this thing called a settlement stipulation. Stipulation is an agreement to add, as to the facts of the case and the penalty reach, right? So terms of a stipulation had to be f- approved by the real estate commission and we can meet with the department of real estate attorney prior to hearing or discuss our, our case. So you can get, it's kind of like we'll provide you an attorney. It's just like when you go to church, when you go to jail, they say you have the right to an attorney. If you can't afford one, we'll appoint you one. Mm-hmm. Same type of situation here. You can, you can get one from the department of real estate. Me personally, I hire my own, just because my attorney's gonna work for me. Mm-hmm. The state attorney may or may not be, it's the luck of the draw, right? It could be on their side. It could be, yeah. it could be you don't know who you're gonna get. Right. I would hire my own. Hopefully, I do. <laughs> <laughs> you can also say, listen, I know that I'm in trouble. I don't wanna get involved with this. I'm just gonna give my license away. I'm gonna give it back, right? You can relinquish your license voluntarily. People do that, okay? Um, the reason they do that is because they're not going to be subject to the fines, mm-hmm. right? So right here it says, use to avoid discipline hearing, hearing relinquishes the right in lieu of discipline, so you're not going to be required to take any additional courses. You're not going to be retired, required to take any of the fines. Now, we're talking about administratively. It doesn't mean you can't get sued for criminal, mm-hmm. right? And you get a permanent revocation of your license. You're never going to get it again, right? But if you know you're guilty, give your license away. Right? That way you don't get additional fines. Step five will be your informal or formal hearing, depending on which one you chose, right? To not dispute or to dispute. Dispute would be formal. Non-dispute would be either informal or no hearing. You're gonna waive it, right? So informal hearing is conducted. If there's no disputed facts, there's no reason to have a formal hearing. Case is heard by FREC at a commission meeting. Where's the commission meet in Orlando once a quarter? Right? Remember that? Melinda wants a quarter. Licensee admits to the facts of the case, so we're saying, yes, I did this. And we can submit some type of mitigations in hope of, hey, listen, it's like a plea bargain, right? Yes, I did it. I understand I made a mistake. Can we reduce the penalty knowing that I'm going to do the education and do what I need to do to make it better, right? The FREC will then excuse the probable panel, probable cause panel and decides the case, will decide. So the FREC member is seven members. You had two people that may or may not be current members. One of them has to be current, but may or the other person may not. They're gonna excuse those two people because they've already found it. They've already found this person guilty, right? Probable cause. Now the other people are gonna vote on this and say, okay, is this good or is this bad? What are we gonna do? How are we gonna handle this situation? Does that make sense? But you're not gonna put somebody that already said you're guilty back on the cause, because that's going to give you, what is that called, double jeopardy? Mm-hmm. Do they use the same members of the frank? It's only seven. There's only seven members. Right, that's, that's the seven. two that, are, that have already been involved are not going to be involved in this. Okay. Whether they're a member of the frank or not, you're not going to put the same two people in front of them. Okay. Because two of them, one of them has to be a member of the frank. Right. One of them. Current or former. Right. So... You can do a waiver hearing. Waiver hearing is if the subject complains to file timely, then you've just waived your rights, right? So we've waived the election of rights. We're no longer going to have our choice if we can do a formal and formal hearing or waive it, right? The case will proceed as, as laid out in the books, right? So heard by the FREC in this informal hearing, and they make a decision. But if you waive it and you don't respond, they're just going to, they're just going to, go through the process without you. Formal hearing is different because now you've responded within your 21 days and you've requested to have your voice heard, right? Formal hearing is required if there's disputed facts. So if one person says you did one thing, another person says you did something else, there's a disputed fact, we have to, we then have to have a formal hearing. DDPR has to agree with you, so Department of Business professional regulation has to agree with you to say that there is a dispute of facts. They don't say, he's just saying that to get out of it, right? And then you have, it's under Florida statute, this is section 120. Um, 
division administrative hearings and the administrative law judge. These are the people who are going to administer the, the, the final the final rulings. So we've gotten through the, this whole investigation, this hearing. Now we have a recommended order. So when that's when the judge hits the gavel and says, "Hey, I've got the ruling." And the ruling is for the plaintiff for $500, right? Something like that, right? Judge Lautner back in the day, right? <laughs> submitted by administrative, so this is submitted by the administrative law judge that we saw on the previous page, right? Findings of fact, the conclusions of the law, they're gonna recommend a penalty based on how harsh, how much of a crime this really was. It's not really a crime, but it could be some type of violation, right? In accordance to Freck's range of penalties. So if they say, that the maximum fine for this is $500, they can go anywhere from zero to $500. They can't go over that, right? If they say the maximum fine is $20,000, they can go up to $20,000, they're not gonna go over that, right? So then they pretty much make the limits? So right, so Frank already has a limit, right? Okay. Now, that doesn't mean that somebody can't sue you civilly, somebody can't sue you criminally, mm -hmm. right? That's a different case. We're talking about administrative mm -hmm. only. So then, once that, that, that uh, formal hearing's done, we had to recommend an order, we have now have a final order, right? So the judge is recommending this order, then the real estate commission will issue the final order. So they're the people that stamp it, deliver it, and send it to you, right? What they say is gonna go, right? Final decision is to innocence of guilt, penalty, probable cause, people are now excused. Fred considers what the judge has to say, and then they, they impose their fines, right? They, they recommend or their final exceptions and they mail you a, a letter saying, yeah. hey, congratulations, you passed this, your fine's $500, hey, congratulations, you you're now getting revoked, yeah. right? That's not a congratulations, yeah. but it might be if you hate real estate, <laughs> but <laughs> it's not congratulations if you just got in the business because you're wanting to start out, right? Um, once all that's done, they say, we're going to revoke your license, you can appeal. During that appeal, as long as you haven't had a summary suspension, you can still practice, right? This whole time, you can still practice. Licensee can appeal the order. You have 30 days to do that. File with DBPR and District Court of Appeals. So you have to file this formally. We can request a stay of enforcement. And this is what I was talking about. It stops your revocation. It stops your suspension in that final order if you were, and then you can continue to practice if you get one of these stays. So stay in this case means I want to stay doing real estate. Mm -hmm. In order to stay doing real estate, I filed a stay of enforcement so that my license continues to be active and valid. To obtain obtain this, you have to do a writ of supersedis, and a supersedis means you're superseding what the commission's saying, right? This writ of supersedis says, hey, Freck, court order says that they can continue to practice even though Freck says no, right? As long as the court says that until the appeal is heard, then you, then you can move forward, right? You can continue to practice. But you have to, you have to request a stay and you have to get this writ of supersedis, mm -hmm. right? If you're in that situation, chances are your license is going to get revoked. But go ahead and Practice for the next upset. 30 days and get as much money as you can <laughs> so that you can move forward. Now, if you've done something really bad like fraud, like Ponzi schemes, like embezzlement, something like that, they're probably not going to give you this. They're probably just going to be like, no. Right? They're going to throw you in jail and move on, right? Take your license. So here's your three types of penalties. You have administrative penalties that's done by the FREC, right? So notice of non-compliance, your sign was wrong. You did, you know, something like that, right? Civil court penalties and then criminal penalties. I mean, civil self-explanatory, right? That's between me and you as lay people, right? Criminal will be between the law enforcement and us, right? Three different types of penalties. Here's your administrative penalties. Denial of application, right? And these are listed in order of severity. Denial of your application means you never got to practice. There's not any fines or anything. They're just going to deny your application or to renew, right? I didn't do my continuing education, and I tried to renew my license. Well, guess what? Your license gets denied, right? 
Notice of non-compliance, it's very minor. They're gonna send you a notice, say you have 15 days to correct it. We're gonna check again in 15 days, right? And we're gonna go through all these. Citation is a small fine, like maybe $100, $50. Probation while completing terms of penalty. So you can't practice until you correct this, right? Administrative fines, small again, maybe 500 bucks, something like that. Suspension is self-explanatory. I'm suspending your license, you can't practice. Revocation is, you're no longer doing real estate ever in the state of Florida, right? Mm -hmm. right. So here's, here's, that's the short term of what these things are. These are the long term. So, and I kind of, kind of go through all these slides with one line, with a one line explanation. It's just easier to remember, but. Notice of non-compliance, again, first time offense mender, uh, First time event defense, uh, minor, minor violation established by the rule, right? Doesn't result in any physical harm or emotional, uh, monetary harm of the public. So you wanna make sure you're not hurting somebody. This is something that's very small. Maybe I forgot to put my sign on the door, right? right. 15 days to fix it, right? So let's say Freck happened to come in while we were changing my windows and my sign was on my window here, right? They saw it was gone, they're gonna send me a notice of non-compliance. They're probably gonna give me one right away, right? And then I'm gonna just fix it and tell them it's done. Sometimes these kind of things, they might even take a picture, hey, it's here. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? They're, it's not a big deal, you're not harming the public, right? Failure to comply, uh, comply timely will maybe push you forward into something further, like a citation or some type of discipline. Least severe, right? So again, it's, it's one of those very minor things. Citation issued by the DVPR, investigators, auditors, minor violations listed, right? You have 30 days to accept or reject that violation. No action, right here, the case is closed. File with objection, 30 days. Your penalty is between 100 and 500 dollars. Again, it's a very small violation, right? They failed to follow the requirements of team advertising, right? So team advertising advertises without a brokerage name, for example. Because anytime you advertise, you have to have the name of the broker. Mm -hmm. Not the physical name of your broker, the name of the brokerage. Right? People, people like to put broker and broker together, but it's the name of the brokerage. You don't have to put my name on my company stuff. You have to put the company name on the company stuff. Right? It doesn't say Jimmy Little John's real estate company. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> but people take things literally, but that's not the case. The case is it has to be the name of the brokerage and team average. You can't say, I'm Guillermo and Associates, right? Because Associates is one of those words we're not allowed to have in our team no name. Brokerage, right? no brokerage. Agency, brokers, Agency. realtors. You can't have those in your name, right? Realty, right? LLC. This is Lena Realty, LLC, right? Can't do it. We're not allowed to. That was chapter five for y'all. <laughs> so it'll be on the video. This is each other team. Right. Well, you came up with a good name the other yeah, day. Yeah. What was the other name you came up with? Paisanos. Paisanos team. Like, that's good. Yeah, right. we might roll with that for a while. Right. So, more serious things become you move forward. So, here's your administrative penalty of $5,000 fine, right? Up to $5,000. Violation of Chapter 455, 475. Suspension can be up to 10 years, right? And revocation is the most severe. That's when you lose your license. Mm -hmm. What did you do? Revocation is permanent, but what is really bad about revocation, you have licenses in multiple states, there's a good chance the other states will revoke their licenses too. Wow. Because they're gonna report it, mm -hmm. right? So if our friend runs a, uh, and I like to use the word Ponzi scheme, if they run that and they steal, defraud people out of $20 million, for example, do you think they're gonna do that in Utah or California or Michigan as well? Yeah, possibly. I mean, chances are they're gonna run that in a different state too, mm -hmm. so let's go ahead and just revoke them all. Makes right? sense. Put them out of business forever because they're obviously not looking out for the public. But they're dangerous to the public. Right. And maybe they're not dangerous to the public, but chances are they are, right? They're not, so. Then we have this thing called revocation without prejudice so here's when your license gets revoked but you don't get penalized for it so I applied for a real estate license 
and was issued a nursing license. I never passed the nursing license. So they revoked my, they revoked my nursing license and reissued my real estate license. Mm -hmm. And so they revoked this without prejudice. It means you can still get your nursing license if you wanted to follow that, that road one day. Right, temporary. They made a mistake. We, we gave you this license in mistake. They gave you a sales associate's license. They gave you a general, a general contractor's license when you apply for a broker's license. Right. They give you the wrong license. So they're going to revoke it and not hurt you, right? Because this is a license issued in error. It's revoked, but it doesn't get held against you because it was an administrative error. Right? The part of business makes makes mistakes. I mean, people get paid hourly salary. They're, they've had a bad day. They made a mistake. Right? They're not doing it to hurt you. So if you see revocation without prejudice, what that means is we're not going to hold a grudge against you because we made a mistake. Right? It was our fault. We recognize it was our fault. I'm not going to take your license away or your livelihood away from you because we made a mistake. Right? Nobody's going to see that. It's not going to get reported or anything like that. So we'll go through like two more slides. We'll take a break. So civil and criminal penalties. Civil penalties are imposed by who? Civil courts, right? Pretty self-explanatory. Fire sues to recover an earnest money deposit that an EDO instructed the broker to give to the seller. Now remember, we're gonna talk about that piece when we talk about the real estate recovery fund later in the chapter. Criminal penalties are issued in criminal court, uh, court and DBPR must report criminal violations to the state attorney's office. So anytime we have a criminal violation, they're gonna report you to state attorney for prosecution, right? Because correct doesn't prosecute. They do the administrative piece. We'll, we'll take a break here, and we're going to talk about